you all and your children at different events. So I gathered photos from every family, and by the time it was all done in eight days, we had 1,960 photos. <laughs> 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 I'm going home. Send them to me. <laughs> so just so you know, I'm dragging. It was so fun for me thinking about this, but I got to admit, when I showed up today, I couldn't want to see I haven't slept since Wednesday morning. <laughs> That's the truth, too. It took that long. It was so important to me. It meant a lot to me. You, you all need to know Lucy May. Where's Lucy May? You know, God blessed me with a voice, and I put that on video format, and each song that I was singing, I would take the meaning of all of it and put it with it and made some great videos. So, as I was getting all these together, I knew it would be... Okay, so as I was getting this together, every picture, I prayed about the whole thing. What's going to happen right here is such a blessing. I'm talking everything that went together. Our family is so blessed. So every single picture of everybody in the family and the story of how this all happened. I mean, mom and dad, 50 years ago, got started. I've got some help here. And I've got a little bit of narrating stuff that's important. So I'm actually going to talk about a few things that goes back to what I one of my folders is called Genesis. And I'm gonna to explain to you guys where we're at, what happened, and how we came to this part. And then some of it, just so you'll understand, because we've always been told stories, I have a few little pictures and stuff that you can see along the way. I don't like giving speeches by reading, but because this needs to be somewhat organized, I'm gonna to have to. I've noticed that whenever people read speeches, it becomes a little rhythmic and they lose the emotion to it. And humans in your church and the surrounding of your family, you understand it tails off. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Everything I wrote down here, I'm going to tell you, it was like church. Some of the pictures that I looked at, I, I would have to. The stories I, from the photos that I was a part of, I had to get up and I walk around to keep them falling. There's such an emotional time. <laughs> so here we are. I'm going to take off. So give me just a few minutes here. Okay. So this is a great, powerful, and meaningful story I'm about to tell you here. God's hand was in it. Like a book in the Bible, a book filled with amazing and wonderful stories of God's will, God's plan, and the blessings from the Lord every step of the way. I spent a lot of time in prayer about this. I can feel the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And with the humble ability for God to show me how to paint a picture for you. We're all so blessed. Granny Mullen raised her kids in church. Her children were taught to pray and love the Lord. The first several years of my life, 
I always appreciated our prayer times before we'd leave Grand's. So we would all gather around, all my uncles, all my cousins, we'd form a big circle. It was so important to Granny and Grandpa that we all joined in prayer. And it was just, the living room at Granny and Grandpa's house was spirit filled. You never could forget the sound of Granny's voice when she was praying. You can never forget the light rumbling of Grandpa Mother, who had a little bit of a hearing situation, but when I was a little kid, I could get down and I said my own prayer, I stick my finger in my ears, and I could pray really loud, and it would still be coming from my heart, but I didn't want to hear myself. So by the time everybody got finished praying in that living room with Granny, so by the time I got fin everybody got finished praying, the last person praying would be the one who ends it. And you could always hear you could always hear Grandpa's tone as he was praying. His prayers would sound a little bit uh, like, you, if you ever heard Grandpa pray, it would sound like, Lord, we thank you. Bless you, Jesus. And he'd be up and down a little bit. So, at the time, by the time Grandpa got finished praying, you could, you could never forget Grandpa's soft, unforgettable tones up and down as he prayed. Nobody got up until the last voice said their amens when everyone prayed together. Being raised in church was so important. Usually, Granny and Grandpa was the last one to pray, but the Holy Spirit could be felt. I'm tears in our eyes as He blessed all of us before we left and went our separate ways to home. We've all been raised in church and taken our families to church. We all know God has kept us safe. We can call on Him anytime and anywhere. So, I need all of you to have an open mind and an open heart. This isn't just playtime. This is something's going on. The Spirit's trying to talk to the whole pile of us. I can't, part of me not being able to sleep is just I feel something's changing big time in our family and it's in a great way. So if you have an open heart and an open mind, this took forever to do, but each picture tells a story. So picture this story for me as I try to paint you a beautiful picture before we dive into our memories together here. So here we go. So the year is 1974. Picture a very busy lady crosses paths with a former classmate of hers from high school. She graduated with him in 1964, but a lot of life had gone by for both of them during the past eight years since high school. She, she was very intelligent, super intelligent, had college degrees in education among other things, and was a former teacher at various public school systems in Texas, as well as Oklahoma. But now she lived in Tulsa. She had such a big heart. She loved animals, so good with animals, every kind of animal, livestock, horses, especially household pets. Just loved them. Suck a thing up, cut out like this, and give monies to them. You don't see it. You don't see it. She does it to little babies, too. Peace and little cheese. So, so Aaron was. She had a Siamese cat named Lucy, for anybody that remembered that cat. And I was just a little bitty kid and I remember. She had an awesome dog named Bunny. Everyone who knew her loved that sweet dog named Bunny. So I had the privilege of going with mom and dad several months ago to one of mom's past sorority sisters' funeral. It was awesome. I was so glad to get to see her in action. Her and a whole pile of her sorority sisters during the funeral was up front, and they all sang together. Apparently, they had all sang together in a choir at college, and it was beautiful. Everybody, it sounded amazing and awesome. Whenever it was all went up front, I was, I was glad to see some of the faces I recognized, been lifelong friends moms brought around. And so they were talking about their college days and stuff. And so standing next to dad, I just brought it up. So do you guys remember that dog named Bunny? Oh my goodness, two or three of them piped up immediately. Yeah, they knew Bunny. She would put sweaters on the dog. Everywhere she went, the dog went. Everybody that knew mom knew Bunny too. So everyone that knew her loved that sweet dog named Bunny. So she was kind and thoughtful, yet still she was super firm when she needed to be. She knew how to do it. 
Teaching in these school systems, no matter what age group, she knew how to do it. She could get on level with a student of any age. Educating any age group. Educating and encouraging others was truly her calling. And you all know what I'm talking about if you've been around her. She'll see something, point it out to you, and then have a little discussion with you. It's important that she teaches you and educates you. So when we were kids, we'd go on trips. We didn't just go on a trip, turn us loose, run around on the beach. We would tour places along the way and learn about history and stuff. Educating and encouraging others was truly her calling. And it was certainly the main desire in her life. Now recently, she landed a very responsible task as an educator at a facility for special needs children. Now picture this part. The special needs children, the facility it was super important, and the land there had been donated by a hobby cattle rancher by the name of Riley G. Hissom. So eventually, as they built this, it's one of the twins who's a seatback. <laughs> <laughs> So, so recently she had this job that she got and the land was donated by a guy named Riley G. Hissom. And here's the story behind Hissom. So, did we lose that? We're getting it back on. Okay, you so, can keep it. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get ready to jump on this one. I got a few things I'm going to tell you about because I'm not going to narrate all this. I got a few things I need to share with you. So, it's one thing to grow up, get the stories told about mom and dad, but to be there firsthand, I actually saw a lot of this stuff. So, picture this. So, the land was donated by Riley Hissom and eventually would be named Hissom Memorial Center. So this particular piece of land is about 225 acres, located in West Tulsa on Highway 51, right along the banks of the Arkansas River there. So now, for my family members with teaching degrees, and there's a bang of it, this facility was necessary at the time in Oklahoma because at this time, the Oklahoma State Schools had become overloaded with special needs children. So picture in the early 70s, we don't have what we have today. We didn't have the ADA situations and how important it was for special needs children. And the, the population has gotten out of control. So there was a lack of qualified teachers that knew how to handle special needs children. Now, special needs has quite a range. So Enid and Paul's Valley had a state school for the mentally retarded. They called it that. And that was the name of it. They were the first to have enrollments at this new Hissa Memorial Center. Eastern State Hospital also had students, occupants, that moved into Hissa. Eastern State was located in Vena, Vena, Benita. So Hissa Memorial Center was created, built, and they finished it in the mid-60s, but some 10 years earlier than what this lady took this job. <laughs> You're putting people to sleep. <laughs> I'm about to fall asleep. All right, here we go. So, here's the thing with this history of the world, and I'm painting this picture because you need to understand how important it was for somebody that knows what they're doing is good with children. So, it functioned as a diagnostic treatment, a rehabilitation, a training, a research community center that provided inpatient and outpatient services. So, like a dormitory, this school also housed many of its students. And now, here we are, and by the mid-1970s, there were about 600 pupils there. And as you can imagine, they were a little short-staffed for what the facility needed. So, she had accepted an offer to become part of the staff as an educator at his memorial. So you can picture the special needs would be special needs, children. Bless their hearts. Oh, they're so awesome. 
But they had to be taught how to wash their hands and how to bathe. Deaf kids needed hearing devices. Mom learned sign language. Other kids had to have, well, they had braille and learn how to walk with a walking stick and taught braille. So she learned how to read braille. And she taught sign language. They've closed the facility down. I have a few pictures of what you would see at Hissom. And I have a whole pile of photos of what the facility looks now. We need to back out of that. If you put play all, we need to back out of this. Hey, so listen. The point is the facility closed down, but it was great for her. So So she learned to read Braille. She knew sign language. She could capture the attention of the students there with an understanding of their minds like you couldn't imagine. She was so good with them all. Now, on a side note, I myself actually had the blessing and the privilege to see her give firsthand. I was able to spend time around her on the campus there a few times. I was just a little bitty kid, but I'll never forget it. It was amazing. She was so good with them. She referred to them as kids, as children. Some of them were actually adults, but they had the mind of children. And it was important that they had special people like her. It fit great. So she was super at this job. Okay, so now picture this man that she's caught up to from her graduating high school. His past eight years have been really busy too. So, and also real productive. <laughs> I, I didn't say reproductive. I said very productive. But I also put pun in the end. You see, this man made a life in two states as well. He moved to Kansas City, Kansas out of high school, which was basically what a lot of his family did after graduating at the time. He went to a great church, surrounded by others from his family at this great church. He got a job as a carpenter doing construction work, building houses, and doing frame work. And he was super strong, like strong as two men. People talked about how strong he was. He talked about his grip. From his days growing up working on his dad's dairy farm milking cows, he developed forearms bigger than a Popeye the Sailor cartoon. He just had these, looked like a softball was stuck in there. But he didn't even know spinach. So this, <laughs> this construction job came easy for his grip. And I've been told plenty along the way that when it came to driving a 16 pin nail, Jim Mullen hits it twice and moves on to the next one. He can start a nail and just keep going, hit it twice and drive it sinking. I, I can't even imagine what that would look like. So imagine working hard all your life on a farm and you've worked hard and now you get paid for working hard? Let me tell you something. That passed on down the line. We all grew up working hard. And then we get out and we outwork everybody around us because we knew what it was like to work hard. All of us worked hard. We always grew up around working hard. So now after a while, he got married, worked a couple of other jobs, including a salesman for Fuller Brush Company. <laughs> now, seriously, now he was incredibly intelligent, super personable. Everyone who ever met him loved this guy. You couldn't help it. He was just fun and always laughing. When he was in the room, you knew it. And let me tell you, you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been in a big crowd and dad's there, you, it's, he, you, you just knew it. You could hear him. He was hilarious. Everybody loved being around him. You couldn't help it. So he was just fun and laughing. And, you know, you knew he was in the room. Everybody knew it. He just brightened the place up. He's super good with people of all ages. I'm talking great with older people, people his own age, little mm -hmm. kids. He was especially good with children. Such a great father and absolutely loved his kids. He actually had four children. And each one had come along, if you will, with their own fascinating individual story. So, and some funnier than ever still to this day. But while he was working there, he gets a job at a place called Manor Bakery. So this is what it looked like. And he probably recognizes some of this, maybe not. But it was located on Pennsylvania Avenue in Kansas City's busy industrial area at the time. So eventually it was all out by Colonial. 
And this probably looked like one of the trucks that he eventually drove. So we'll hang on right there for a second. Okay, so now get this. This man that she's come across, having worked with Manor Bakery, he drove a bread truck, including being a salesman in a bread truck. So he, he had routes that he ran. Every morning he'd have to be there early and he'd have to stock his truck. And then he'd have to run the routes early in the morning and take them to these stores and take off the old, put the fresh stuff back on, goes back in one of these rooms and he's, Awesome. She, it, I mean, he's so busy, he can't even keep up with the loads that he's got. So he's back in one of his warehouses. There's a couple of inches deep of water, and somebody's back there on their knees shoving a cable down a hole, and the water goes down. And if it's me, I'm picturing a screaming, noisy Spartan sewer machine, because you can hear them coming from the other end of the building. So he winds up talking to the guy asking him what he's doing. Why is that water going down? How do you get something like that? What's the story behind that? So he starts, his wheel starts cranking and sees how easy it is that all you gotta do is take this cable, run it down a pipe, and the water goes down, I'm in. So he spent a little bit of time figuring out how he could build up business. Eventually left that and started his own plumbing company. It was actually called Mullen Sewer and Drain Service in Kansas City. So. After a little bit, a couple of years went by, and you know, life in Kansas City became a little bit exhausting. Things were working out with his personal life relationships. So we left Kansas City and moved to Tulsa. And he got there with one truck, full set of equipment, and whatever else he needed to start another business, left the one in Kansas behind, and started all over again. Here's a whole new chapter in his life. He'd have a co-worker that some of us may recognize his name, Rod Lacey was one of the first people that he was around in the beginning. They eventually parted ways. Then he began a partnership with his oldest brother, Wayne. So this is Uncle Wayne. Pretty blurred, but in case you don't know, you haven't met him, this is dad's oldest brother. He's the oldest of all eight of them. These pictures go back in the day. So let's hold that there. So Wayne and his wife, would have a home in South Broken Arrow on Elm Street with a swimming pool. And your mom would love going over there. She loved going hanging out with Uncle Wayne and Aunt Joanne. So Wayne had also lived in Kansas City and had a septic pumping service going up there. He told me plenty of stories about it. So this man and Wayne were a good fit together. The two brothers named their business Moan Plumbing. Now, this man she found here lived in an A-frame house that he purchased near 61st Memorial. The home was only a few years old at the time, but these are current pictures of it. Let's hold that right there. Okay. Charles. So he worked from his house. Even from what I remember, he had a super nice lady that answered phones from him. And he called several plumbing companies around that didn't do sewer and drain work and he would take their sewer drain calls for him. So the, uh, anyway, the business was taken off grid. So somebody was handling their service calls. This is gonna be pretty cool for everyone. You've probably never seen these pictures. There's a whole pile of That's Yvonne, and she always had a little dog. And that's Gregory. And this drill. <laughs> I forgot the drill sucked his thumb until he was forever old. I told him that I was always sucking his thumb. And I see these pictures and this guy's busting out laughing. Oh, Look at that! Wow, that's daddy. That's how young dad was. Oh. <laughs> Can you pause that right there? <laughs> <laughs> I put that there on purpose. Yeah. Okay. So that's pretty cool for everyone. I don't think anyone has seen these pictures. I've seen Jim with his hair that long. Oh, look at that. Is that Jim? Or that much hair? Yeah. It looks like Elvis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it does. I wish you could go back and show it. Got Molly figured out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it goes pretty fast. 
would just rattle off in tongues. It was amazing. Just goosebumps. The Holy Spirit spoke to her. The anointing of the Holy Spirit was so strong. She shared it with Jim. They talked about those four kids. We got to get them. She knew those four kids needed to be a part of the bigger plan that God had. I'm sure it was a tough decision for her. Having such a simple life, and now she's going to take on a man that's got these four kids, and we're talking little kids. So it was a tough decision. But it's a decision she didn't have to be made. Can you imagine the stories we hear about? How do you like to be Joseph? And here's Mary. And you're doubting. Everybody's laughing at you. Is this really something you want to take on? You don't have to. You can go about your own life doing your own thing. So did she. So how did Joseph have any idea what's going on by his ahead? Gail Morris married Jim Moe, September 1st, 1974. Look at that young kid. She's so pretty. Look at that young kid. Look at the station wagon. I was looking at that, I'm like, I was reading my designated seat. I was like, those four. Let's <laughs> go. So they got custody of the four kids. They raised them together. They even had three more amazing kids together. And let me tell you, this is the beginning. Right here, 50 years ago, God had a plan. That was Grandma Evelyn's favorite, you see. <laughs> so. 50 years ago, God had a plan. There's going to be a lot of paths for a lot of people who knew how massive God's plan would be. At a time when you see that picture there with mom and dad together, here we are 50 years later. Putting God first has blessed this family, all of us. You can't tell me, look around, God has not blessed all of us with our health, our finances, our love for our families. I can't even believe how big this family is. So just speaking for myself, I mean, I just, I don't know where I'd be if she hadn't done that 50 years ago. And stuff like that is really hard for me. So here we are now, seven kids. We figured it out. There's 35 grands and great grands. There's all 44 of them with spouses. Along with their husbands and wives and boyfriends and girlfriends, here we come today. We thank God together with Him, reflect on life with Him. And so here we are 50 years later, and I don't have to say anything more. We can just run these. You guys will get a kick out of them. They all come together. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg.